Okay, 9 hours 25 in a beautiful Georgetown in the studios of HBTV Channel 9. For the first time, we've got our um, brother and friend uh, coming out of uh, England. His name is Colin Babb. And um, he is, I understand, of Guyanese extraction. And uh, he just popped in, actually, after I heard that he was here in Guyana. I thought it would be good for him to sit, chat a little with me and you. Uh, and so he kindly consented to be here, and I'm very thankful for that. Colin, welcome to the Wake Up Guyana show. Good morning. Right. <laughs> and uh, I like that description of me of uh, being of Guyanese extraction. Oh, I well. like that. Yeah, that's what I'm told. Taken <laughs> from the soil, and taken over to uh, to Great Britain. I like that. Yes, yes. Well, I'm happy that you're here, as I said. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that you know, what I was reading parts of of, of the, the book last night. I, I I got through at least the the acknowledgement and, and yeah. the introduction. Um, and uh, I realized that cricket plays a very important part I in your life. I'm going to get to that. I just thought that I, sh I, that I should announce that. But I want you to tell me and tell us a, a little bit yeah. more ab about yourself. I've yeah. heard things, um, well, you know, th that, that you've been involved in and so on, but I'd like you to say it for yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Colin Babb, and uh, the extraction bit is, <laughs> is the fact that my mother is from Guyana. She's from Georgetown, Guyana, and she migrated to England in the early 60s. And as some of your viewers uh, are aware, um, there was a tide of migration from Guyana and the Caribbean to Britain in the 50s and 60s. And uh, yeah, I'm the product of that. And I was born in London, in England. And I've lived in London for a lot of my life and other parts of England and other countries outside England. And uh, I've done quite a few things over the years, um, largely working for the BBC for about 13 years, uh, doing various broadcasting websites, uh, radio and educational support work and I've also uh, worked in other areas I've worked for uh, a corporate company for a year but I don't want to talk about that because it wasn't <laughs> a fantastic experience uh, I've also worked uh, in a lower uh, what I call the lower echelons of the music industry and I've worked as a teacher I've worked as a librarian uh, quite a few other things but I would say that uh, media related work writing journalism has always been uh, an important part of my life even when I wasn't doing that full time yeah. and uh, this book is interesting well, it's, a, it's quite a major forward step for me because I've written in other people's books mm. I've written chapters and articles in websites and magazines and I've edited uh, small scale magazines but I haven't produced a book written by myself from start to finish so I guess this is a, a major step for me in a way it, it is. It would be. <laughs> yes. It, it, it's the first book that you exactly. You know, were, were and one of the things I want to talk about involved. here in Guyana is not just about me and my book, and which I, I think is important because I want to let people know who I am. But mm. I want to talk about all the interesting things Guyanese people are doing in the diaspora and in Britain in particular, because uh, the impression I get every time I come back to Guyana, which is every three, four, five years, is that there's a, a, a focus on the diaspora in North America. Yes, Canada and true. the USA and also the diaspora or the Guyanese diaspora in other islands in the Caribbean so I'm here to just state that there are a lot of Guyanese people in Britain doing wonderful things and um, I'm here to spread that message well it, it, it brings me to the point of wanting to know um, in what way you you think you can serve to make that connection closer uh, because we've both contended um, that you know, the, the connection is basically with, with the United States of America uh, and, and North America, basically, yeah? yeah I think and that's to do with uh, migration yeah, patterns because right. generally mo most people from Guyana migrate to North America rather than Britain now. Mm. I think that really is part, part of it, which mm. is understandable. There yeah. are reasons for that. Um, so uh, and I think generally migration from the Caribbean to Britain has seized up since the 80s or 70s and 80s. So that connection with the Caribbean is becoming a lot weaker. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm here to sort of be the voice of the British diaspora for about how long I'm on this program for. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's quite a task, I know. Yeah, but, I know. But, big, but big the task. type of person I know you, you are, you, you'll try your best to get that done. I'm curious, though. I, I have, you know, met a lot of, a, a lot of persons who um, are of Guyanese parentage and, and uh, living abroad, in, you know, in America, in England, in Canada, and so on. And yet they still seem to want to have this connection with Guyana. 
uh, you know, the land of birth of their parents, and, and you know, not so much them. You know, you were born in England, and you seem to be uh, close to Guyana. Yeah. Well, the thing is, is I, I would regard myself as someone who has various technicals, tentacles. Can I rewind that? <laughs> uh, I, I, various fingers in, in different pies, as, as they say in England. Um, I'm very much uh, born and bred in Britain. Britain is very much part of what I am. And of course, when my family were born and brought up, they were brought up in the British Empire. So obviously that connection is extremely strong. And there's lots of things I love about being British and living and being brought up in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, there's also lots of things I love about being of Caribbean descent and the Caribbean culture. And I always uh, keep a keen eye on political and economic developments in the Caribbean. And I took it a step further and I even did a master's in Caribbean studies at the University of Warwick in England. So. You know, I, I feel as if I've got feet in different in different states. Uh, I, I've got a British mentality. I've got a Caribbean mentality. My heart and soul is part British, part Caribbean. So I tend to try and uh, keep hold of the things that I think are very important to me. And of course, having a mother from Guyana means that Guyana is very important to me. So I guess it's just one of the strong connections, which is part of my personality and part of my culture makeup. And it's something that's always going to be part of me. Yeah. So um, it's something that I, I'd like to talk about. And, and also the Guyanese community in England is quite a small community mm -hmm. uh, compared to other uh, Caribbean communities, particularly the, the Jamaican community. So we're kind of um, a small community, which is shrinking in a way, because a lot of our older uh, people are, are sh well, sadly passing away or going back to live in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's a shrinking community. Yeah, we can stretch that a little bit further. Um, your mom is Guyanese. Yes. I think your dad is Barbados. From Barbados. Ba yes. So yeah. you've got two two communities to try to connect. Yeah, Guy. <laughs> uh, as they say, Guy Beige. I don't know whether you're familiar with that term, <laughs> Guy Beige. Beige. I've never heard it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I brought that term to Guyana, Guy Beige. In fact, this is a, a trend which is being set in Britain of people who've got different uh, uh, parents from different parts of the Caribbean. Um, a friend of mine, his I think his father is from Guyana. And his mother's from Grenada, so he calls himself a Guy Gren. <laughs> and there's another guy I, I know who uh, is half, is one parent is from Dominica and one parent is from Jamaica, so he's a Dom Jam. So oh it, my God. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it's a kind of a trend which is uh, appearing in England where people talk about their heritage in various ways. And of course, um, in Great Britain, of course, it was a, a place where people from different parts of the Caribbean met for the first time. Because mm -hmm. if you were Guyanese, it's not uh, certain you would have met a Jamaican until you have been to London. Mm -hmm. This is where London or Britain was the place where people from the Caribbean met each other for the first time. Um, if you were from Grenada, it's not certain you would have met someone from Antigua, for example. Mm -hmm. So Britain was a place where different people from different parts of the Caribbean met each other for the first time and created a sort of unity in exile. Yes. So, yes. you know, if you were from one part of the Caribbean and you're a bit distrustful or suspicious of people from another island, you could actually meet someone from that island in England for the first time. And we all shared a common migrant experience which kind of, which kind of bonded us together to a point. Obviously the Caribbean community, the diaspora has always been quite sectarian. You know, I don't like you, you're Jamaican. I don't like you, you're from Solution, etc., etc. But I think there were certain things that bonded us together and one of the things that brought us together in Britain was cricket. Quite because true. for that mm -hmm. test match, mm -hmm. for those five days, it didn't really matter where you were from. It didn't matter what your social and cultural experience was from, whether you were European, whether you were Indian, whether you were Syrian, whether you were Portuguese, whether you were a mix of all four, five, six, or Chinese or whatever. For those five days, we were all united, focused on a team that represented us all. And I think that helped to bring people together. Certainly. But I think, too, that bonding is automatic in, in those circumstances. Let's see, take the example. Um, let's say you and I are from Georgetown. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I know you by seeing you. We're not friends. We don't communicate. We don't speak. Yeah. But if we go to Burbies and we meet in Burbies, you know, for some strange reason, you start to speak with each other because, yeah. you know, you're, you're out of that, that society. Yeah. Um, so I guess that's part of the reason, too, that... Yeah bonding was so easy mm. then came the great game of cricket um and as you you so eloquently um uh, explained in in the book uh, that this is, is is the one sport that 
bring the peoples of the region together. And uh, I would like you to talk a little bit more uh, about this particular book because mm. I have found it, even though I've just touched the surface, very interesting so far. And it's uh, hard to believe that this is your first real um, book or, or by, your, by yourself. Yes, you know, I've, I've written road. chapters and articles mm -hmm. over the years, but it's my first real book. And uh, um, that's camera. There we are. Yeah. That's the cover available in Austin's. Thank you very much. Oh, it's at Austin's. Uh, am I allowed to okay. do those mm -hmm. commercials there? I've slipped that one in. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no rules and regulations. Um, yeah. Uh, th uh, there's also, um, can I just quickly talk about the other books here? Because oh, yes, go ahead. I'm, this book has been produced by um, a company called Hansip. Hansip, yeah. And Hansip have been uh, going in Britain since the 1970s. In fact, 1970s when they first started. And there's another guy in his collection, of course, because the guy who set up Hansip is Arif Ali. And Arif Ali is somebody who migrated from Guyana to Britain and eventually set up this company. Okay. So again, we have a guy in his connection. And again, it's somebody from the diaspora doing something quite notable. And yeah, Hansip is a, a company which has produced many, many books uh, around many, many different topics by many, many different authors uh, throughout the Caribbean and also Africa and Asia. Um, and it's a really, really, really fantastic publishing company. And they published my book, so I would say that. But they've obviously, but they've published other books by Guyanese writers, including, uh, so I can even think through and remind myself, excuse me, uh, Clem C. Turan, for example. And there's Mr. Waldron, who's written a fantastic book, Victor Waldron, about traveling to Britain from Guyana. Uh, yeah, so there's quite a few different uh, authors from all around the Caribbean, including Guyana. And then there's the very popular second edition book, uh, which is about Guyana, which you might have seen here and there. So, yeah, fantastic publication, uh, fantastic publishing company. And they've done a great job in bringing lots of books to the, to the attention of not just the Caribbean diaspora, but people from outside the diaspora. Because there's plenty of people from different backgrounds in Britain who are actually interested in this kind of writing. You don't have to be... I always say when I do my one-man shows in England, because I do a little one-man show about growing up in Britain and cricket and, and just funny little stories about my life connected with the book. And I, my pitch is always, you don't have to be from the Caribbean to like it. Mm -hmm. And it, it seems to work because I always have lots of people from different backgrounds coming to my events who are interested in the book. Yeah. Which is a very long way of answering your question. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I, I behaved like a politician there. But um, yeah, I mean, about the book itself, I mean, what, what um, inspired me to write it is that I've always been interested in uh, writing and thinking about the Caribbean community in Britain. And I've always been a f fan of Caribbean cricket. But I wouldn't describe myself as a cricket writer. I, I just like writing about cricket. But I wouldn't say I'm a cricket writer. That's not how I write my, how I make my living. But I think um, that connection between cricket and the Caribbean community is something which hasn't really been explored in great depth. And so I thought, you know, with the interest that I have, that I'd really, really explore it. And uh, you said some very kind things about my book, which I appreciate. And I'm writing another version, which is going to be a revised and updated version of this book, which, in my opinion, is going to be bigger and better. Okay. And go into more depth. And I've done more interviews with more people, including uh, I did a great interview with Basil Butcher mm -hmm. last week. Um, fantastic interview. Gave me a lot of insight into being a cricketer, coming to England, playing against England in the 1960s. Um, just the experiences and the connection he made with the community there and the fact he had a sister who was living in London. I mean, these really are really interesting so stories which I like to get from cricketers, from commentators, from writers from fans, from anybody who was connected with West Indian cricket and cricket in general during that during that period that I'm writing for, from, sorry, yeah. which is from the 1920s onwards. Yeah. Well, you know, I said that, that you did make some salient points in, in, in the book. One of them is the fact that uh, during the, the, the period of West Indies dominance, you know, the, the West Indian fans were so proud of, of our team. And then you also went to the point where we started to lose that dominance. In fact, it's on the decline. Um, it has declined. And uh, since you have been so much into West Indian cricket and so on, you may have um, not so much a solution, but an assessment of, of the situation here. And I want to point out clearly that you, you, you made the point, I underline this one, that it might be as a result of 
um, the board not, you know, doing what they really should do. Uh, and they might be uh, the cause of, of, of the decline. I, I'd like you to address that point. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, there's no doubt that cricket and the Caribbean community in Britain, the relationship has, um, let's say, dissolved. It, it's not as strong as it used to be. And you're quite right to point out that one of the reasons is because of the results in the last 15 to 20 to 25 years. Uh, and also, you're right to point out that the part of the uh, disillusionment with cricket uh, from the Caribbean diaspora is, is because they feel that the board has mismanaged cricket for the last, well, for God knows how many years. I mean, this is something that I get when I travel throughout the Caribbean, whether I'm in Barbados or St. Lucia or wherever. <laughs> there are always plenty of people who want to criticise the board. Any rum shop anywhere in the Caribbean, you'll get the same, you'll get the same response. Um, but the point I'd like to make, and the point that's uh, made in the book, is that there are other reasons why uh, cricket and the Caribbean commun community in Britain have kind of experienced a bit of a divorce. Not just about the results. I think the Caribbean community in Britain has changed a lot. So you have people who are second, third, fourth, fifth generation mm -hmm. who don't really see themselves as being West Indian. So the fact that a West Indian team comes over to play in England doesn't really matter to them because they don't feel that connection that yeah, maybe my yeah. parents did or I did. So, you know, they definitely, definitely feel a lot more British and English, uh, which is fine. I think that's fine. That's the way communities pro progress or change and alter. And I don't have any problem with that whatsoever because my son is probably going to feel like that as well. Right, Although we'll right. try and... And you did ex establish mm. the point earlier too that, mm. that um, the older ones have passed on. This is true. With that connection. Exactly. You know, so the community is changing all the yeah. time. So that co connection with cricket has changed. Also, cricket in England um, seems to be reverting towards being a private school game. And when I mean private school, I mean a game which is played in fee-paying schools where you have to pay because obviously the, the majority of people in Britain, 93% go to what we call state schools. And of course, the majority of Afro-Caribbean or Caribbean people in Britain go to state schools. So we, we kind of feel as if we're disconnected with cricket, which is being played mainly in, in fee-paying schools, which is a bit of a, an issue there. Also, on TV, you can't watch cricket unless you have money. You have to pay for it because you don't get free to access cricket on television apart from the IPL. Really? Uh, often highlights, yeah. So you can't watch test matches unless you pay a subscription. So that means that if you're a casual cricket fan, you know, and you're interested about the game, you, you've, that, that access has been denied. Um, so yeah, there are many, many different issues around it. And also another one is the, the fact that other sports are very, very much more important to second, third and fourth people of Caribbean descent, i.e. football and athletics and rugby union and many other sports. For example, you might have heard of a racing driver called Lewis Hamilton. Hamilton, yeah. Yeah, his, um, his father is of Grenadian descent. Yes. Now, when I was growing up, I wouldn't have thought that somebody of Caribbean descent in Britain would be a Formula One racing driver. But that's happening. We're producing gymnasts. We're producing rugby union players. We're producing people who are doing well in many, many other sports, not just cricket. So there's lots of competition for, for, for people's time, space and enthusiasm when it comes to sport in Britain and that includes cricket. So cricket faces a challenge there as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also because of the sh shrinking of the West Indian population, cricket clubs. Now, the West Indian Cricket Club in Britain was a place where you could go, you could meet friends. It was a social spot. It was a place of community. It was a place of social refuge. When you came from Britain, you'd go to the local cricket club and they would say, well, there's a place over there you could rent. You might get a job over there. It was almost a, a support network building. but cricket clubs aren't as important now because they don't have the members. They're not, not getting the, the new members from the Caribbean community. And often, when you go to cricket clubs in Britain, you'd find that a lot of the players are non-Caribbean because they need to make up the teams from somewhere. Right, right. So the cricket club, which was a real stronghold and bastion of, of West Indian culture, is, is, is not, not as much as it used to be. And that, I think, is all part of the reason. I mean, I'm giving away too much in the book here, <laughs> but I, I'm just feeding out. No, that the, might the whet the appetite yes, to understand you. because some there, you. there are people out there who really would like to get to the bottom of this, you know, yeah. to understand what is really happening. Yeah. And and you had the benefit of of um, viewing cricket uh, in the days of yore with, with with the Lloyds and 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 the the Canais and so on. I'm sure. Yeah, well, I can tell you my first <laughs> cricket experience in 1973. I watched the West Indies touring them with Canai as a captain. That was my first cricket experience. 
Or oh, clear, remember. Right. Yeah. Uh, and and so you 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 have the the, the double um, pleasure of of seeing the the present day cricket team in action too. Yeah. I I raise this because I, I I want to understand if this too couldn't have been a part of our decline. The seriousness on the part of the participants, the players themselves. Um, we talk about. Um, I remember watching that documentary on Lloyd, who was so upset when uh, the English told him that that they're going to make the West Indies gravel. Oh yeah, that's you know, probably that, that fire in Babylon. Uh, something. Yeah, yes. that, that was you know, made by a British director. Uh, and, yeah. and then Ri Richards, Viv Richards, subsequently uh, took the mantle, and and he yeah. decided that this is not only going to be a game of cricket; it yeah, has to yeah. do with our pride and all of that. Yeah. Are the players these days mm. so deep into? Uh, the whole understanding of what cricket is between England and, and the West Indies. It's interesting that you should say that because this is a common uh, feeling by the diaspora that the, when they come over, the team, to represent the uh, the diaspora, when they play England in England, there isn't uh, the commitment as it was before. This is often a criticism. Although I've spoken to one ex-player um, who I probably won't name, but he did tell me with absolute certainty that that wasn't the case, that they do try, they do play, they are 100% committed when they come to England, but it's just that the results just haven't been there. Yeah, but you just don't seem um, to get an impression at all. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can understand. The impression and the reality are often two different things, but I, I, I would say that maybe other countries throughout the last 10, 15, 20 years have just basically become better. Um, and I think that's the thing now. It's, and a lot of it is to do with money and resources. England, India and Australia... Uh, other countries which have the resources mm -hmm. to spend money mm -hmm. on cricket and even South Africa which has less money than those three countries is a very uh, uh, often one of the top test countries but I think one of the things about cricket that I've noticed in the last five ten years is that there are three layers of cricket now you have 2020 cricket you have test cricket and you have one day cricket so mm -hmm. it's very difficult for one team to be dominant in all three yeah, formats yeah, so true. Therefore, the idea of one team dominating cricket, I don't think you're going to see that now. You're going to see 2020 specialists, one-day specialists, and test specialists. Yeah, like and we've seen some of the guys now retiring from test because they want to focus on the 2020 one day game. It's quite lucrative in mm -hmm. India in particular. And I think the West Indies could still be a force in limited overs and 2020 cricket. Yes, in test cricket, I think so too. In test cricket, probably not at this moment in time and I'm being very very diplomatic and British about this <laughs> <laughs> but I think it, with semi different formats of cricket you're going to get different teams dominating but absolutely right um, I think the impression that the team doesn't have the same passion for the diaspora as it did before perhaps gives the impression that they're they're not as committed but um, I think a lot of it's to do with other countries just being better at organising their cricket, but who knows in the future what will happen? I mean, I've left the book on an optimistic note um, to say su to suggest, um, particularly in the second book that I'm writing, that um, in the future, you know, I can see the West Indies doing well in the shorter formats of the game, which you know, success is success. Yeah, well, um, well, there's still some hope. Um, and and one last quick question I I, I want to have you um, for you is uh, do you see, because I've been listening to persons out there who seem to think that the way things are happening now, this is 2014, and in the future, you just may not have test cricket anymore because look at the grounds when the, the, the test matches are being played. You know, hardly can fill one, one stand. Uh, what are your thoughts here? Do you think it's going to be phased out at some point in time? Well, again, very, very relevant question to some of the work I've done in the last five years as regards test cricket. Um, Generally, 2020 matches and one-day matches in England attract more West Indian supporters. Test cricket, not as much. And one of the uh, one of the reasons I've been told by some of the older generation is the, is the cost. Test matches generally cost a lot more. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's an issue. Also, can people take time off from work for five days in a, uh, in a tightening economic climate yeah. in Britain to watch five days of cricket? Probably not. And also, um, I was talking to Tony Cozy about this, that the West Indian way in Britain, or the West Indian way, but in Britain, is not to pay in advance, because a lot of test matches, you have to pay in advance, organise yourself online, website. So that's not the West Indian way. We like to just turn up if we feel the mood is right, and yeah. the queue. Yeah. That, that yeah. tradition doesn't exist in England anymore when it comes to test cricket. But, um, yeah, 
in England though, in England I would say Test cricket is still reasonably well attended, but obviously in the Caribbean not as much. But focusing it from a British perspective, I would say that generally the West Indies fans come out more for one day in 2020 cricket. A because they're more likely to see a win, and B for the reasons I've told you, Test cricket is not as popular for the diaspora as it once was. But I'd like to throw in something else into the mix if you don't mind, and that is um, I thought that I've had. Um, and something that Lance Gibbs mentioned to me when I spoke to him on the phone as part of the research for book two is that why don't the West Indies play more matches in America, in the USA? Why not? There's a huge diaspora there. Mm -hmm. When I go to New York, which I don't often, but when I do, I go down to, um, what's the park? Pro is it Prospect Park in Brooklyn? Oh, yeah. I, I wouldn't. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, the big park. In, and you see West Indians playing cricket. I mean, there's a huge diaspora there, so why can't the West Indies play neutral matches against England or Pakistan or India, which there's a huge Indian diaspora in America? I thought at one stage they were getting to that. Well, they did play New Zealand a couple of years ago. Yes, it was yes. kind of an experiment in Florida. Yes. But I think mm. you could reach out to the diaspora in that way by playing mm. more matches in America. I don't know how you can organise it because there's so much cricket played throughout the year. There's so many matches. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's almost a cricket overload now, but... That's a thought. That's a thought. Well, you know, lots of your ideas and so on are contained in, in this book, and I would like to encourage the public out there to go to Austin's bookstore, and you get you 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 can't see it um, properly here, but yeah, I can tell you it says here they gave the crowd plenty fun, um, attractive looking book. So when you get get into it, you'll <laughs> uh, I guess we'll yes. find more attraction. That's from 1963. Yeah, the crowd running onto the pitch in 1963. Yes. Yes. Um, and last night I was trying to figure out the ages of the people <laughs> that I see here running out. They must be in their 70s and 80s oh, running out in the field Yeah, here. probably 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. A, mm -hmm. a generation of hope. Because the West Indies gave a lot of uh, people who were struggling and facing tough times in Britain uh, a sign of hope and uh, helped them to raise their self-esteem. Yeah. And, you know, it was even when they weren't winning, it, they were like the ambassadors mm. for a lot of the community in Britain. And also, it wasn't just about winning. It wasn't just about winning. It was a lot of it to do with fun. You could go there, take your food, make some noise, congregate. The sort of thing, where could you, else could you do that in Britain? There were yeah. no other avenues to yeah. congregate uh, as a diaspora. So that's why cricket was very important. Colin, we can go on all morning, but we, we can't. Thank <laughs> you. I hope I've woken up your more audience. To be done. Um, but I'm so happy that you had the time to come down here uh, and, and share your ideas with us. And I hope that, uh, you know, the folks out there can, can purchase this book and, and read up. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you very Thank much you very for much having much. me. Thank you. All right. And enjoy the rest of your stay in Guyana. Thank you. But even if you if you don't, you come here pretty often, I understand. So yeah. you'll make up another time. Yes, yeah, so <laughs> hopefully when the next book is out, I'll be here again. Thank you very much. Wonderful.